I knew it was going to be trouble from the first time he stepped on the quad. Stragview had just gotten over COVID, the plague the world was still wary about, and inmates were on high alert. Something most people don't understand is that when your population is limited to about a thousand guys in the same pool of disease, your immune system isn't as durable as it once was. A cold or the flu can sometimes put down a whole dorm like it never would on the street. And if they get it, then they know it only came from two places. You can't get something from the bubble once you're in the bubble. So sickness either comes from the guards or new inmates. And they know it. A pod can usually tell who's sick and with what quicker than we can. And sometimes they'll quarantine an inmate or push them out before they can get everyone else sick. It actually happened not long ago, and it started a riot that killed three COs, 30 inmates, and sent a lot from both camps to the infirmary with injuries. It had all started because of lockdown and sick inmates, and no one wanted to see it happen again. So, when they brought in inmate Clarion, I sighed audibly. God damn it, I cursed and Jackson looked up to see what had caught my eye. What? It's just a new guy. Is he starting trouble already? He is trouble, I said, watching the other inmates as they marked him. Officer Gerber pushed him into the quad, H3 to be exact, and he stumbled out there with his mat and his bedroll and a look that made me think of lost puppies. He was pale, very pale, and his eyes looked sunken as if he hadn't been sleeping well. He was scrawny, almost emaciated, and I didn't like the way he winced and rubbed his belly. His stomach was the biggest part of him, and it protruded against the front of his uniform shirt like a balloon. It looked like the stomach of a much larger man, but it wasn't until I'd been watching him for a while that I finally put my finger on it. His stomach reminded me of a pregnant woman's stomach. Johnson looked past me, focusing on the new guy as he tried to find his cell, and finally just shrugged. Looks fine to me. You're just paranoid, he said, as he went back to his paperwork. I wish I had been. The next day, I was approached by inmate Pelichek, the houseman for the quad, telling me he needed to change cells. I looked at my roster and realized he was inmate Clarion's new roommate, and felt the same creeping dread I had the day before. Why? You've been in that cell for as long as I can remember. It's him or me, and I know how this works. If you'll move me, he can just have the cell. Why? Did he snore or something? Pelichek shuddered like someone had dumped cold water on him. If that were all it was, it would be fine. No, the man is not right. He talks to himself at night. Talks like he's talking to a baby. I woke up this morning after finally going to sleep, and he was sitting on the toilet and rubbing his stomach as he talked. He shut up when he noticed me seeing him, but I will not share a room with him. The man is crazy, and my mother always told me that crazy is catching. I gave Pelichak a skeptical look. No mean feat when the man is six feet two, but I could see he wasn't joking. Pelichek is a long-term resident, an ex-Russian national who's in prison for 30 years for beating a man to death in a bar fight. His claim of self-defense was enough to save him from a life sentence, but not enough to convince the jury that caving in the man's skull had been self-defense. The guy was huge. I'd seen him trading his carbs for boiled eggs most every morning before eating a dozen or so of them and working out most of the day. If this guy was freaked out, then Clarion must be pretty weird. The only cell I got's with Mueller, and you know he snores like a buzzsaw. Better the buzz saw than that, Pelichek said, thanking me before leaving to pack his things. Thirty minutes later, he was moving the last of his stuff into Mueller's cell, trading his bottom bunk for a top bunk with a loud snore. I started watching Clarion after that, trying to figure out what had spooked Pelichek so bad, and I noticed other inmates giving him a wide berth. He ate alone, choosing to sit at a table they seemed to have designated for him, he kept to his cell mostly, seeming to prefer solitude. He received no mail, no phone calls, and he only went out to wreck when he was forced to. He didn't seem to like the sun much, 
and slept during the day unless asked to get up. His stomach neither grew or shrank, his skin remained pale, and the bruises stayed around his eyes. I looked him up, something I didn't do often, and found out he was here for murder. He had apparently murdered his sister, but the circumstances were pretty murky. Clarion had been something of a hermit, living in the woods in a little shack, and only coming into town when absolutely necessary. He had been doing this for decades, but when he hadn't been seen in town for a week, his sister had ventured to his cabin to check on him. When she hadn't come back, the police had gone to check on them both and found something pretty grisly. The body of Sarah Clarion had been found under the cabin. She'd been drained of all her fluids, all the nutrients in her body, and the coroner had said that it looked like someone had sucked her dry like a juice box. Stephen Clarion, her brother, was the only person on the property, and he had admitted to moving the body, but not to the murder. Police felt sure it was him somehow, and he'd been charged thusly. Now he was Stragview's problem, one of many, and the police in Hiawassee got to pretend that they had actually done something. Regardless, I still had to take care of the man, and I would. I soon discovered what Pelichek had meant when he said Clarion had been talking to himself. He didn't keep a roommate longer than a week the whole time I knew him, and that was only about a month. They all said the same thing. He was strange. He stared at them. He talked to himself. He sang to himself, but it all shook out to the fact that they thought he was crazy. So, one night, as I was doing around, I came to his cell, and sure enough, Clarion was singing to himself. He had been there about a week and a half at this point, and I hadn't seen him do much more than sleep or stare off into space. Jackson said he had caught some singing, but... He had mostly ignored it. Not much got to Jackson, he was old hat at this, but I was still a little curious about the mysteries this place sometimes held. So I got closer to his cell, and I recognized what he was singing. Hush little baby, don't say a word, daddy's gonna buy you a mockingbird. I turned my flashlight off and crept up, listening as he sang to himself. And if that mockingbird don't sing, daddy's gonna buy you a diamond ring. I leaned around to the little window on the cell, trying to get a peek at him, and saw him sitting on the toilet, rubbing his stomach. And if that diamond ring turns brass, daddy's gonna buy you a looking glass. He was rubbing something on his stomach, lotion or oil, and crooning to it. The light coming from the overhead and there was dim, little more than a nightlight, but I watched him, mesmerized as he stroked his stomach and sang. And if that looking glass gets broke, daddy's gonna buy you a billy goat. As he touched his stomach, I could see something move beneath his hand. It was like ropes beneath his skin, like eels in a pot, and... It seemed to touch his hand almost lovingly. With his shirt off, I could see how thin his chest was compared to the rest of him. It was sunken in, the bones jutting against his skin, but the stomach beneath it was still swollen and distended. And if that billy goat won't pull, daddy's gonna... I must have made a noise or leaned against the door too hard because he suddenly looked up and I pushed myself out of the window and leaned against the door as... I prayed he wouldn't come looking. What I'd seen had been terrifying, but the thought of him seeing me was even worse. I didn't know what he had within him, but it was bad enough that I didn't want him to know that I had seen it. The next night, we came in to find him in a corner of the day room. It seemed he had decided to come out of his shell. See, Jackson said, he's settling in. I knew all it would take was a little time. He came out of his shell, but it might have been better if he hadn't. For the next three weeks, more than one inmate began to complain about being sick. A ton of sick calls suddenly went in, and medical was swamped with complaints of people being sluggish, having no energy, and generally feeling bad. A nurse told me it appeared they had anemia, and a lot of them had low iron counts. I didn't know much about that, but 
I knew that the pale skin and the black circles under their eyes looked very familiar. I wasn't the only one who noticed either. Bryce, another long-term resident of H-Dorm, started spreading it around that Clarion had something catching. The sick people looked like he did, and that couldn't be a coincidence. They had to do something about it. They had to stop it from happening, and it had something to do with inmate Clarion. I was pretty sure they were right, too. I'd seen Clarion go in and out of cells all week, leaving before too much stir could be made, and the inmate would always go to the infirmary the next day. Unfortunately, Bryce did not handle it the way he should have. He attacked Clarion in the quad, in full view of the officer station, while both of us were in the bubble. I had seen Bryce and about six others shooting dark looks at Clarion as he stood in the corner by the kiosk. I was sort of new, but not new enough that I couldn't recognize something about to go south real hard. Jackson shook his head, claiming I was just looking for trouble, but I didn't think so. Jackson finally got tired of me just watching them and tossed me some paperwork, telling me I could do a little work if I meant to just sit around. I looked up after hearing someone yell and saw them backing Clarion towards the door as he put his hands up defensively. I cursed, seeing the knife in Bryce's hand, and told Jackson to call a code blue. Jackson grabbed his radio as I went running, and I'd come into the hallway between the quads as I heard Clarion begging for his life. I was fumbling keys, trying to find the right one, when I heard him say something that chilled me to the bone. Don't do it. I can't be held responsible for what happens if you do. Bullshit, Bryce said. You ain't gonna do nothing. Please, I'm begging you. Don't... But he grunted, and I figured Clarion had been stabbed. I had the key in the lock when a shadow fell over me. I looked up to see something long and white and slithering as it rose above the assembled men. They began to run, but not fast enough. The thing was rising out of a hole in Clarion, a jagged knife wound in his stomach. It looked like a worm, or a tentacle maybe, and it was thicker than it had any right to be. I thought it was one big something, but when it separated, I could see that it was actually many, many slithering white things. They shot out and caught the men, wrapping around them as they tore them to pieces. Blood hit the floor, followed by parts of people, and as they were torn up, other writhing things began to fall on the blood and suck it off the ground. It was mesmerizing, the way it cleaned them up, and I saw how it drained the parts of fluid as well. Just like it had done to his sister, said a whispery little voice in the back of my head. The team came in to find me on the floor, the key still in my hand, with nothing but withered inmate parts lying around the place, and a terrified clarion huddled against the door as he covered his face. I explained in a shaky voice what I had seen, but Medical found no wounds on clarion at all. Other inmates were questioned, but most of them claimed they hadn't seen anything, the typical Stragview line. Inmates wouldn't have admitted to seeing a UFO most of the time, and if there was camera footage, I never saw it. The mess was cleaned up, the bodies were disposed of, families were notified, and life went on. I was given a few days to recuperate, and when I came back, Clarion was no longer my problem. He wasn't any dorm's problem, and had seemingly disappeared from Stragview altogether. I never learned what happened to him, but I think about him sometimes, and wonder what became of him. I also wonder about whatever it was that came out of him to protect him. The way it drank all that blood from its attackers, it has to be taking a toll on him as well. I wonder how long it'll be before Clarion is no more, and it's forced to find a new host to befriend. You're still here. Thanks so much for joining us for tonight's spooky tale. If you'd like a little bit more spooky in your life, why not click on one of the videos that appears at the end of our story? Or maybe head on over to one of our playlists where you can get your fill of spooky content. If you like your spooky a little more tactile, I've got a new book that's come out. 
If you'd like your own copy, there's a link below in the description where you can get your own copy of my spooky book. If you like what you see here on the channel and think you might like to support in a more monetized way, then why not come over to Patreon or become a member on YouTube? Speaking of, let's go ahead and thank our members now. Thanks to Siv Garstead, Unicorn Hollow, and Army Dude for being our spooky ghost contributors. Thanks to Janet, Lee Kendall, Psycat, Rhonda J, Sue Casper, and Valinator for being our spooky skeleton contributors. And thanks to O oh Snap, Hi Stacy, Winter, Zeronin, Stephanie Carrington, Tyler Parker, Cinnamon Fox, Grim Reaper, Tomboy Top Uwu, and Queen Sheba for being our ghostly reader tier contributors. And a big thanks to Scott Donahue for being our ghostly writer tier contributor. Thanks, everyone. We just couldn't do the show without you. If you'd like to support the channel, then come on down to Patreon or become a member on YouTube. Spooky Skeleton Tier Contributors, that's our $5 tier, get their spooky 12 hours early at 8.30 a.m. as opposed to 8.30 p.m. My time, of course. And while Ghostly Reading is uh, only a tier that's available on Patreon, you get a signed copy of my book anytime I write one on your doorstep in hopefully a timely manner. If you'd like a book, we have many on Amazon. I've got links below if you'd like to follow those. Um, should get you to my page so you can buy any one of my eight books I believe we're up to now. I'm sure they'd look really nice on your shelf, and I'll sign them for you if you can find me out in the wild. And as always, thanks for stopping by. Dr. Plague, signing off. Have a wonderful evening.